So, hi everybody, I'm Nicolas Pecheux and I will present some work we did at LIMSI, a uh, lab in Paris. So, the work focused on cross-lingual part, part of speech and mainly on the ambiguous learning that is induced by this framework. So, the context is, well, we, it's well known now that supervised machine learning is very useful in many NLP tasks, but for all these tasks we really need, require annotated data. And the quality and the amount of this annotated data is very important to to yield good performance. And unfortunately, that's not a so common situation for many tasks and also for many languages where we don't have this kind of data. So this is an example. So what can we do when we don't have this annotated data? So it's an old problem and many work have focused on unsupervised learning where well, we try to learn without this annotated data. Another solution is to crawl some data from crowdsourcing or, for, or from indirect sources and to use it as a proxy to do some kind of weekly supervised learning or semi-supervised. And still in the same way, uh, something that's quite useful is to try to benefit from the annotation in one language where we do have them, to use them in another language. So this has uh, a quite line of research for this. And here the idea is cross-lingual transfer, so we have a source-rich language where we have the notation, we use this annotation, and we try to transfer them into other languages. So for example, for part of speech, we have English, where we have the annotations, and we have a low resource, wait, here it's French, but we have to imagine it's a low resource one, and we can project the tags, right? The problem with such an approach is that usually you only have partial labels on the target side, and only they're very noisy because the transfer are not of good quality in many cases. Oops. So that, that's a problem. And standard machine learning techniques need us fully supervised to work, right? So machine learning technique habit has to be adapted to this framework. So there have been many works dealing with this problem, and in more general, this kind of problem. So we can use an extension of CRF, which is partially observed CRF, which can handle this partially labeled data. Or we can also integrate the cross-lingual annotation in another way, for example, as constraints in a posterior regularization or maximum expectation, expectation framework. So this has been done, and we are going to compare to these state-of-the-art results. So our contribution are the following. We first cast the problem we've seen of cross-lingual part of speech tagging in the framework of ambiguous learning, and we used the, this framework and those idea, ideas to build a novel method to learn for this task. And well, this shows significant improvement over the previous methods. And also we conduct a more detailed analysis on the results to show how, in fact, evaluation and uh, the performance of this method are really problematic in this framework. And we'll see why. So first, how do we project labels across aligned corpora? So first, we need a strong assumption here that we are not going to discuss is that we can project syntactic information from one language to another. Of course, this is not always true. And to do that easily, we use one universal attack set that is the one of Petrov 212, which allows more or less to, to build similar attack set for all languages, and then we can directly project a noun in one language to a noun in the other. And we only consider these kind of annotations. So, the problem is that transfer base only deliver a partial and also a very noisy uh, annotation framework. So some work I'll deal with this. We can either use filter rules to filter out an unlikely sequence or to try to build more methods to try to, to, to grab only the quality part of the projected annotation. And here in this work, we use a, um, an idea that has been extensively developed in Taxstrom last year which is to combine monolingual information from tagging dictionaries and the projection at the token level constraints. So we are going to go in a little bit into details. So we have two kinds of constraints. The first one are type constraints, which means they apply for every word type. So this is directly given by a dictionary. So we can, for example, crawl dictionary, and we get for almost any language uh, tag, uh, um, a dictionary tag, so we can use uh, type constraints, and we can also build this dictionary directly from the aligned corpora we can have. 
So for example, we have market that appears many times in our uh, read, uh, source side language, so we can project the noun and we get a tag dictionary for uh, from marché, sorry. So here it should be marché in French, we have a tag dictionary like that. And in our work we use both dictionaries and we take the intersection of both to build a bigger dictionary. And the second idea is to use the type constraint, no, the, the token constraint. So first we start with the a, C, a sentence which we can already label with the type constraints. So this gives us an ambiguous labeling for every token. And we can already learn from this. This is the, um, the unsupervised learning in, with dictionaries. And here we use the alignment leaks from the parallel corpora so we can project the tags and we do it in the same uh, way of tags from that we only project a label if it's, it is consistent with the type dictionaries because the type, dic the type constraints are considered more reliable. So the benefit of this is that we diminish considerably the ambiguity on the level and the sentence is still ambiguous but the ambiguity has been reduced and has been reduced for many different tokens. So how do we model, uh, how do we build models for this problem? So the problem is that we don't have as in standard supervised learning one only gold label for every token. Here for some uh, tokens we still have partial ambiguity and we, st we still have partial labels, so ambiguity, uh, even if it has been reduced. So we can see that this problem is an instance of ambiguous learning where for every instance we have a set of possible labels of which only one is true and we can take some ideas of this framework. So that's what we are doing. So we use a new history-based model for sequence learning. So the idea of history-based model is to, instead of trying to do structured learning, we decompose the structured learning process into a sequence of multi-class process. So for each token, we learn a multi-classification problem, which gives us the tag for the current word, knowing the tags we have uh, previously guessed. So here, for example, we are trying to guess the tag for la, and this tag is a simple multi-classification problem, knowing the whole source sentence and the previous tag that have been guessed by the model. So we are, we are decomposing the sequence labeling problem into a sequence of multi-class classification problems. And at each step, we can use features on what has been produced yet. So this kind of model performs quite well in this task. Uh, it's more or less the same results as CRF in general, uh, when, when the full supervision data is provided. And how do we learn? So this is the interesting part. So um, first, when we have full supervision, we can apply a lot of different methods. So one of them is just a perception update. So we use a linear model where we have a set of features phi that can, as I show, use the whole sentence, the previous tags, and information of the current word. And we do a simple perceptron update. That is, if the predicted sequence from this, for this uh, token is not the gold one, then we want to update the labels, and we want to do this in a way that ensures that the gold label is scored better than the predicted one. So here the problem is that we don't have this goal label and we only have a, an ambiguous set where we don't know. So the idea is we don't know which one is the goal label, we're, but we are trying to ensure that all the labels in this reference set are going to be scored better than the, the other one. So here we slightly change the rule, that is if the predicted label is not in the reference set, so the set of possible labels, then we do the update and otherwise we don't do it. And how do we do? We, we just increase all the, um, the features for the labels that are in this tag and we decrease the features for the predicted one. So in some sense we are trying to ensure that we are going to rank better all the, the, the tags in the set that is from, from which one is the good one and trying to lower the predicted which is of course not the good. So for similar problem and using slightly different uh, models, there are theoretical guarantees under middle assumption over on the variety of the ambiguous set that this uh, will lead techniques that allow to learn well uh, on these problems. So let's turn to the experiments. So we experiment on 10 different languages from different families and we always use the English language as the source site and of course the language we have are not really under-resourced as in many works but at least we can compare 
with other previous. So we need parallel corpora, we use the many the Europal, we need, we need also label test data, and we have used the freely available data we found, so mainly it comes from, from the universal dependency tree bank that has been released for universal dependency parsing, which also have the tags in the, in the universal tag set we need. And we use a standard feature set. So. so here are the results. So first, we compare with the CRF baseline. So that's the partially CRF uh, baseline that has been developed in Taxstrom that we re-implement in our setting. And we have our history-based ambiguous learning uh, model also trained. So if we compare the both model on our setting, we see that our model performs significantly better than the other for all but one language. And in many cases, this uh, improvement is significant. Uh, and we also include the other results from the state of the art, which in some cases are not directly comparable because it's not the same constraints, not the same training data, and in some cases, not the same testing data. So it's more to see what uh, the improvement comes from. And if we compare the model two, which is the model from Taxstrom, it's very similar to the CRF, just the data is different. And we see that in many cases we, are, we have the same or even slightly better results. And as the last, we can see what happens when we do purely unsupervised data. And this gives like a timeline of the improvement that have been done by changing the method and the methodology. So if we look at uh, our results, so the state of the art is about 10 for Spanish, for example. Oh, that's not what I want. And we can improve this to eight. So the question is still, is 8.2 good enough? So if we see unsupervised, we, we are more about 30%. So that was not good enough to be used in further application. And the question is, is 8.2 now good enough? So if we compare this, with supervised learning, with the same model, we are only two. So th this is four times worse and as standard supervised learning. So we're not very happy. So uh, this method still is not as good as supervised learning. However, we think there are some explanations to explain why this gap is still so large. So one first reason is the type constraints are not very accurate, right? So on the test set, our type constraints only have a precision of 94. That means that if we really trust this type constraint when we decode, we cannot do a system using them that is better than 6% error rate. And in fact, if we use our supervised learning on the, using the constraints, we have 7.3 error rate. So the problem is that the dictionaries from Wikipedia and from the projected uh, corpora are very noisy. But they're noisy, but that, in our opinion, is not the only case, because we are also doing out-of-domain evaluation in this uh, evaluation setting, which means we train on Europal and we test on some tree banks where the tokenization is different, the domain is different, and the annotation conventions are different. And this last point is quite important, as we will see. First, because we are combining different sources of information that has been um, designed independently, and the annotation in every source is different. So, for example, in English, the numbers are always labeled with the num tags, while in French, they're labeled with adjective or determinant. And this gives systematic biases. And we can find this kind of example for all languages. And this difference in annotation are all the more important because we're combining three different annotations. And it's not only noise in the dictionary, but also convention annotation that are introducing the noise we are observing. So, for example, if we just fixed in the type constraint, some of these frequent uh, annotation mismatch, just by inspecting quickly and fix only some of them, we already get quite improvement over our baseline. And we also designed some further experiments to try to uh, train on the same data set as the supervised. So if we train our supervised model on the same data set as the ambiguous, uh, then we, we, we close the gap between the both methods. So to have uh, gold standard on the aligned data, which we don't have. We have two methods. One is to project the tagging, the, the, to use our supervised method to find the tags, which mostly give the same annotation conventions. And another one is to use an independently designed post taggers, which we also suffer from the tagging convention. So we see that from 2.5, we move to 4.2. This is more domain mismatch. And then we move to 6.1 by using different annotation conventions. So the gap between 2 and 8 can be partially explained by these different ways. 
So to conclude, we just we introduced a new simple and efficient learning way that uh, achieve a better report, the result than the state of the art. And we discuss about the evaluation setting and we see that there, this has to be taken with great care if we want to reach conclusion for this kind of setting. And in particular, we think that by fixing um, um, systematic bias in the annotation process and in the evaluation way we are doing, we can achieve better or better result than just by trying to having a better learning method. So thank you for your attention. So, uh, so I have one comment and one question. So, the comment is that I actually tried that uh, the uh, tech terms of a uh, partially observed uh, approach to uh, Chinese word segmentation, and uh, which was presented on Sunday uh, here. And I also found that it didn't help unless, and as something you mentioned, uh, it, there was a lot of domain. Uh, uh, the, the domain mismatch pro uh, problems or issues, and actually I had to use some uh, domain adaptation techniques uh, like you know easy adapt or uh, feature augmentation, so that it helps. And at the end, I did get some good results, but I have to do uh, domain adaptation. So that's my comment. And the question is: so for your for your for the approach that you that you you used, um, if you have fully labeled data, you know each you know each everything. Every 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 token has exactly one unit. Is this sort of similar to logistic regression? I, I, I it's not very clear to me. Like you know, when what that approach is equivalent to when you know you have fully labeled data. Well, uh, you mean the model here? Yeah. Well, we use a standard uh, linear model, right? So if this model was trained here in the full supervision okay. with a logistic right. with a max end, that would be logistic regression. Here okay. we only do right. So 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 my my thought uh, is that so if you have fully labeled data, do you think this approach uh, is better or performs better uh, than CRF? They perform. Uh, Okay, it really depends on the task, on the domain. Globally, our observation that it, it performed more or less the same. So in this experiment, it performed the same, better for some language, worse for some other, but the results are comparable. And it depends also which kind of feature you put in both models. Because in CRF, we are only order two, while here you can have as many dependencies on the past you want. So if you compare okay, with the same are, feature set. Okay, but these different. are the politic labels, right? Yes. Okay. yes but we, we have dependency on the predicted level as long as you want. And if you put many, then we can get slightly better results. Okay, thank you. So, uh, <coughs> so nice, nice, nice talk. Uh, this is a very simple model that, that works quite well, but I'm, I'm really interested in the, in the trade-off that the, the ambiguity is posing on the, on the final accuracy you can get from training, okay? Yes. So I guess, I'm not sure whether you studied this point, but you probably can, can depart from the, from the correct um, sets of possible labels for every word and then do some kind of uh, uh, removing uh, ambiguity from there and, and inspect how, how the learning is progressing and how the, the error rate is going down. So because maybe if a little manual supervision is allowed to, to get into the process, maybe you can reduce this gap very quickly by very little manual effort. So it would be nice to, so to make this a study. So we, we have tried this. It's not in the article, but probably it will be soon available. So if if the ambiguity is random, the ambiguous learning predict that the model will do the same. So we have observed this, it's, it's okay. However, here the, the ambiguity is not random because for each token we have the word type and this is the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. So if we try to, to directly learn from the typed constraints, which is the maximum ambiguity you can have, the CRF model do not perform well. The HMM can perform, but the CRF do not. So if we project the type constraints everywhere, we have our model that perform where, and we have tried not to perform on every position, but only on some position. And 
If we only project about 10% on the token, we learn as, almost as well as if we project completely. So that partially asks your question. Our model is sensitive to ambiguity, but not that much. We only have to, per, to, to have alignments for about 20% of the world, and this will work. Okay, thank you. So let's take the speaker again.